Walker, um, yes. uh, which we're going to go through, and he's uh, he will present the uh, fee schedule adjustment proposal. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Melnick. Uh, good morning, Council. I'm meeting with you today in your role as the Board of Health to review a 2025 environmental public health fee schedule proposal. We've got with us also uh, our environmental health director, Jerry Preston, and a couple uh, environmental public health program managers if there are any detailed questions. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so uh, at the September Board of Health uh, hearing, I'll be bringing forward an ordinance to update the county code uh, in relation to the to the environmental public health fees for 2025. Uh, today's meeting is to receive guidance on development of that ordinance. So we'll go through, we'll go through some background, uh, the fee model proposal, uh, and then next steps. <clears throat> next slide, please. So the environmental public health uh, fee revenue, it funds activities uh, in the programs on the screen, drinking water protection, uh, recreational water safety, solid and hazardous waste, on-site septic permitting, on-site septic operations and maintenance, food safety, and school health and safety. And for 2025, uh, we are bringing forward a drinking water operations and maintenance program. <clears throat> Next slide, please. All right, I put in, in all my presentations, the environmental public health fees, they're calculated uh, to align strictly with projected program expenses. There is no profit uh, built in. Uh, these, our fee methodology has been reviewed by the state auditor's office on three different occasions. Uh, we've been given a clean bill of health all three times. Uh, I take my job very seriously. So, uh, <clears throat> all right, so from 2011 to 2018, uh, program costs uh, were supplemented uh, by county general fund to cover what was deemed greater good. Uh, greater good is uh, the program work uh, that's not related to a license permit or fee. Uh, for example, uh, a residential waste complaint investigation, uh, food establishment complaint investigation, uh, waterborne illness outbreak investigation. So these are, this is work that the program must do, uh, but it's not really related to a license or a fee. <clears throat> Next slide. <clears throat> All right, 2017-18, that was the last uh, biennial budget. Uh, we had an overall adjustment of 1.35%. Uh, beginning in the 2019 budget, the Board of Health uh, adopted the policy direction to move back towards 100% cost recovery uh, in, in each program, and that was to relieve pressure off of the County General Fund. <clears throat> so you'll see there the next three years were some fairly substantial adjustments to the fees, uh, over 29%, uh, 14.3, and then 9.14 in 2021. <clears throat> Beginning in 2022, we arrived at the current cost recovery model. It's 100% cost recovery in all programs except drinking water safety and on-site septic permitting, which are set at 90%. Uh, this allows for some nominal funding uh, during times of economic downturn. Those are the two programs uh, most heavily tied to construction activity. And the 2008-2009 economic downturn, uh, those programs were decimated. There was no revenue even to even to do the greater good work. That's actually a mandate for us. Um, so 2022, uh, 23 and 24, fairly small increases or adjustments, even a reduction in 2023. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This is the 2025 adjustment. Uh, you'll see the existing programs currently, the adjustment is 8.47. I wanna point out though, that the new drinking water operations and maintenance program, we're not adding positions to staff that program. So if that new program was not added, the 8.47 would be close to the 12.21. So uh, it would, you would not see uh, lower fees overall. The fees would be pretty, pretty much the same. <clears throat> Uh, you do see 11.48% uh, increase in food safety. Uh, my next slide has some notes. I wanna just hit on that one first. Uh, that program for the last two years has had uh, ARPA or American Rescue Plan Act funding to fund two positions. Uh, those positions are now unfortunately moving to being supported by fees. Um, we, can, we can go back one slide. 
I want to, yeah, I, I'll, I'll definitely hit on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out on this slide is the new fee in operations and maintenance, I'm sorry, on site septic operations and maintenance. We're proposing a new non compliant fee. Uh, so this program historically has been funded by a uh, septic operating fee that every landowner with a septic system paid a small amount, roughly $15. Uh, unfortunately, 30% of those uh, homeowners are non-compliant in the required uh, on-site septic inspection schedule. That's where we spend most of our time in that program. Um, so we're adding a non-compliant fee. We're able to actually reduce the fees for the compliant homeowners, and we have a new fee for the non-compliant homeowners. <clears throat> okay, now next slide, sorry. <laughs> So some notes of interest uh, for 2025. <clears throat> the fees are going up 12 12 percent. The, the fee fee revenue is. Uh, Baker Tilly, uh, the average salary budget expense for public health staff is up 9.38 percent. Uh, payroll taxes, Social Security, Medicare, etc. PERS, those go up in line with that. Uh, medical insurance, the average medical insurance budget expense for public health is up 7.99 percent. And then again, the loss of ARPA support in the food safety program. Those are the biggest cost drivers uh, or no, notes of interest on why the 2025 fees are going up more than what we saw previously. And then next slide. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the next step is for us to bring forward the fee schedule and accompanying ordinance to the September Board of Health. Uh, so at this, this, is, this is where I can field questions. <clears throat> Questions by council, but I just have a comment. Karen. Do you have some questions? I don't have I'm a sorry. question. I just have a comment. Go ahead, please. Uh, I just want to thank you for having uh, the foresight to uh, increase the fee for those who are non-compliant, and thereby not forcing those who are compliant to cover the costs of you that are involved with you having to reassess their situation when they're non-compliant. I think that's a really good move because it it uh, pushes for compliance, which is what we're striving for anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? So I, I have a few random ones. Uh, the first, uh, let me just say I agree completely with what Council uh, Bowerman just stated, and I, in the one-on-ones, had brought that up as far as cost uh, reimbursement. Uh, those that, I mean, the biggest problem we have with septic systems, just focusing on that, and from my point of view, is that we have uh, very little enforcement and not significantly enough compliance. And so those that ignore uh, the code and their requirements um, should have to pay the cost um, because it, it becomes a general deterrent. It becomes an inducement to actually comply with the code. Uh, the other part of it is, you know, I've been on a septic system for over 40 years, and uh, and that's different up here. And I brought this up in different contexts as how often you have to inspect. I just went through my inspection again, which I have to do every two years. It was over $200 just to inspect it. Luckily, I didn't have to have it pumped. That, And we've heard from constituents complaining about how much the pumping cost is. <clears throat> these costs are all additive, and what I've been told uh, in these forums is that it is state law that mandates the minimum uh, number of inspections, because in my, from my point of view, I would like to reduce the number of inspections required, but have 100% compliance. I think that in a perfect world is more effective. But uh, costs are outside of our costs are going through the roof uh, for our rural property owners. And we need to look at every um, aspect of this to, to make it as efficient as possible. Perhaps the state should reconsider the, you know, the annual inspections or the biannual inspections 
or the five-year inspection. Some states don't do it at all uh, unless there's a, a sale uh, or unless there's a permit drawn to add a bedroom, for instance. You know, something that's a change uh, from an otherwise perfectly operating system, um, why would the government get involved? So uh, we need to keep costs down, and uh, we're not doing a very good job at that. Um, re regarding your notes of interest, I, I take <laughs> some objection to um, the adjustment of the schedule is a, as a result of loss of ARPA funding. I thought we were doing the smart thing in this county by looking at ARPA funding only, aside from capital improvements, as project positions. You know, because we knew it was limited funding, limited in time and amount. And so any position we funded on ARPA was a project position to terminate when we launched the ARPA funding. And now I, we're kind of bootstrapping it here uh, on these food safety programs and the FTE that resulted from ARPA funding to increase fees. Uh, I disagree with that. I mean, those positions should have been only project positions. If they're not sustainable, they're not sustainable um, with the existing revenue source. But anyway, any comments on, on those comments? Yeah, the, the ARPA positions in the food safety program were project positions. Uh, and at the time, they were intended to address the backlog. One of the, one of the data points that my fee table gives us is it tells us based on the projected volumes, is this program over or understaffed? The 2025 model for the food safety program shows it is, it is understaffed by over three FTE. We're actually uh, asking to add the two that were projects as regular employees. Not now they'll be posted, uh, but we're not even getting to the point where the volume shows that we're actually staffed correctly. I'm hoping that the volume trend tables and we can get by with the number of staff that, that we're adding. The two ARPA positions were project positions. Any other questions or comments by council? And, and I do note for the record, I didn't last session that we do have all council here. We don't do a roll call on these work sessions, but either in person or online, all uh, councilors are participating. Any last words before we move on? Uh, I yes, have Sue, a I see a hand. Yes, thank Please, you. Please go ahead. Uh, could you elaborate on the drinking water operations and maintenance, the new fee, what has triggered that? What's the scope of that? Uh, I'd like a little more information. Excellent question. I'm hoping Chuck Harmon or Jerry Preston are on and can address that. They're both on. They're, they're awesome. both on. Uh, Chuck, can you answer that one for us? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question, Councilor Marshall. Uh, so the, we, the, locally, we've needed to put on board a, a local Group B ordinance, and we are working on that, and, and we'll get that to Council this year. And a local a Group Bs are everywhere from two to four connections, so they're smaller community water systems. Um, we finally, uh, through state support, have been able to pull that together. Group Bs, uh, because there is not a local code and, and, and capacity, there's a lot of these systems out there and we run into problems as they're being implemented or new people that are coming on to uh, a property that is on a shared system. And so the program is intended to add an operation and maintenance component to those drinking water systems that that follows, have to follow certain rules when they apply to us, but there's no follow up to them and ensuring that they're they're maintained properly over time, like larger systems are required to be maintained, the group A's uh, will ensure that both the, the consumers of those systems and the users of those systems are getting uh, high quality water. Uh, secondly, if it's well maintained and, and kept up to working order, that's also protective of groundwater, right? Every well on any that anyone has is a, is a straw into the aquifer. And so good maintenance also helps protect the groundwater. I want to quickly add that in 2013, the department did a focused study 
uh, looking at Group Bs in the county at that time. And, and I'll just mention a couple of the significant statistics that, that came out of that study. 70% of the Group Bs that were surveyed were not in compliance with the water quality monitoring requirements at, that are under the state code. 20% of them were not in compliance with wellhead protection requirements. And again, those, those are maintaining the wellhead in a manner that, that, that you lower the risk of the groundwater being contaminated or the system get, being, becoming contaminated with bacteria. Uh, there were 40% of those, this is, an, this is more specific evidence of that 20%, 40% of those were found the evidence of having rodents in the well house, which again can create a vector which would pollute the water system. And 20% of the group B surveyed had biological or chemical sources within the 100 feet protective zone of the wellhead. And so the intent of finally bringing this to the fore in Clark County is to ensure that we have the capacity to work with well owners to make sure they understand the requirements that we can establish a, a periodic operation and maintenance review uh, so that those conditions are protective. Okay, so these would be uh, shared well systems. They don't yes. have access to municipal water. Would this be more in a rural setting? Yes, generally uh, the group B's are in the rural areas. There are group B's in near and adjacent to public water systems. And there's always a push, especially if the group B's having problems um, to move them into the larger system that has a higher degree of oversight and maintenance, like a group A, like, you know, City of Vancouver, City of Camas, et cetera. And so this had just been left to the homeowners to take care of themselves in the yes. past. And uh, Kent, do you have an estimate of what percentage or how many, what the population is that is relying on these systems? Because if 76% are not compliant, that's uh, that's concerning. Yeah. And, that's, and that's from a, the study done in 2013 Again, with this, with this, having this additional capacity, we can do something more updated. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I didn't have it written down. There are roughly 7,000 group B's in Clark County. Um, I don't have how many connections for each of those, uh, but I, I, we can certainly get back to you with a more definitive answer on how many actual users are and compare that to the population of the county, if you'd like. I just don't have that in front of me right now. I, I'm just curious. So if there's 7,000, so then what that would be multiplied for maybe, you know, four or more connections to that 7,000. Is that, am I understanding that right? Yeah, it, it would range between two to up to 14 connections. Um, and, and so we could, uh, we could get a, a better number to answer your question. Okay, I was just uh, curious about yeah. the scope of the problem. Sounds right. like right. it's a much uh, needed fee and program. Thank you. Last chance for questions or comments before we move on. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Malik and team. Um, we look forward to uh, having it before us again and parsing through the numbers. Thank you very so much. We have a comprehensive